Hey, Miss Heidi, so much. Ariel, I commend you for getting back in the saddle. Good job. That's hard to do. My goodness. I would have walked away. You did a good job. Proud of you. Proud of you. Appreciate all the teenagers that are ministering to us in music tonight. And uh, you're ministering that. Hebrew, or numbers, let's start, start there. We'll get the Hebrews in a second. Numbers, let's go there. Numbers chapter 11, if you'll join me there. Numbers chapter 11. Now, the title of the message is this, How to Make Camp Great. And there's great anticipation. I can sense it building not only my own house, but here at church, among the teenagers and things, heading off to camp, getting excited about it. And so that's a great thing. But not only is this message about how to make camp great, it's also how to make the youth group great. Because we don't want to just have a good week at camp or a great week. We want to have a great youth group. It's the, also the answer to how to have a great church. And when we gather together and as we meet together, it's how, to have a great, it's how to have a great home. These things are necessary. If in your house, your home, your family, you want it to be great, this is a good way to have it. And so we could go on and on. The application is manifold here. We are obviously primarily applying it to camp, but it's for everything, really. And I would challenge you and I to think where we are, what we are part of. Maybe our family needs to hear this tonight. Maybe you as a church member need to hear this tonight. Maybe as you, as a member of a youth, the youth group, maybe as a teenager, you're not going to camp, but this message would challenge you how to make your youth group great. And so we can apply it in many different ways. One of the things that we go through in preparation for camp, and I'm sure there's many parents that have been doing this this week, you may even be doing it tonight after the service, and that's you sit down there with your teen or you stand up and you go in there, okay, do you have everything you need? And you look inside their uh, suitcase, and you start to look and inspect. Maybe you say, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have that? Yeah, you go through the list. Or maybe, my wife was doing it just last night, going through the list. All right, do you have this? 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 And going down the line to make sure you have everything. Why is that? Because, my friend, you don't want to go somewhere. You don't want to go to camp not having everything you need. All of us have probably gone on a trip or something like that, and you're like, oh, man, I forgot that. And honestly, it affected your trip. It's not as good as it could have been. It's not as great or as fun or whatever the case may be. It affected it. It took away from it. It, it made it not so great. And I'll tell you, certainly soap and shampoo, very important, amen? Deodorant, fantastic. Yes, please bring that, okay? Those are important things. Those are necessaries for camp. Certain shoes, the right change of clothes, uh, sports uh, paraphernalia, gloves, things like that. Very important. Cleats, okay? But there are a few items spiritually that you need to make sure you have. Teenager, going to camp. Yeah, these are also things that will ensure that your youth group is great, too, if you have them. It'll make sure your church is great. In fact, if you have these at home, it'll make sure that home life is great. Every time you gather, every time we, we, we do, if we have these things, you say, you know what? I need to make sure I have these packed. I, these are in me, and these are not something that I can throw in a suitcase. These are something that I have spiritually in my spirit, in my soul, in my mind, my attitude, and so forth that must come to play. So what are they? Well, let's start with the first one. There's just three things, and I'll tell you ahead of time, uh, the first one we're spending a lot of time on. So after we get done with number one, you're going to be like, we're here till nine. Don't worry. And the next two are not nearly as long. But number one, it's found in Numbers chapter 11. Look there with me, if you will. Numbers chapter 11, verse one, we have a great little story in one verse. It says this, and when the people, that's the Israelites, the Jews, complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost part of the camp. I mean, what a story. One little verse. Israel complains. God is displeased. God's anger is kindled. God disciplines. Many die. One little verse. It's quite an amazing little story. Here they are. This is Israel. What are they doing? Well, get it. I, I, don't miss it. They are complaining but they are also forgetting. See, I, I want you to see tonight, and something I don't want you to forget, is that when we are complaining about something in our lives, when we're whining and murmuring, uh, it means we have forgotten at least three things. So you can't complain without forgetting something. And young people, adults like all of us, we need to remember, hey, when I'm complaining, it also means that I'm forgetting something. Now listen, let's be honest. Complaining, whining, murmuring is an ongoing problem in some of our lives. Hey, young people, be very easy. The moment your mom and dad wake you up tomorrow, they wait, try to wake you up. Uh, they attempt to wake you up. Why do we have to get up there? Why do we have to? Pastor Tony, why do we have to leave at five? Boy, you can start the day off wrong complaining, Amen. 
I mean, it can st- I mean, th- this is something. That, listen, there's probably somebody here today, you complain about what was for lunch. Mm-hmm. Right, moms? Somebody complained. Somebody complained about that nap not being long enough. Somebody complained about something, murmuring. This is something we wrestle with in Bible. Now listen, every time you and I complain, and I'm not exempt from it, every time we complain, it means we're forgetting three things. Hey, Pastor Henry, what are the three things that we're forgetting? Three crucial things. Number one, it's this. In complaining, okay, let's back up. Number one, one of the things we need to take with us to camp is this. A spirit free of complaining and full of contentment. You want to make home great? You want to make youth group great? You want to make church great? You have a spirit free of complaining, and that's full of contentment. Contentment, okay? Uh, What do we forget? Well, one of the things we forget is simply this. When I complain, it means I have forgotten the considerable blessings that have already been bestowed on me. Okay. We forget. We, we, we forgot. Now think about it. Israel in this sense. Numbers chapter 11. They've already forgotten that they have been saved from Israel or excuse me, from Egypt, that Israel has been saved from Egypt. They have been saved from from slavery. That's what was happening in Egypt. Number two, you know what? They were already delivered from the very vile, atrocious, cruel hand of Pharaoh. Could you imagine what Pharaoh would have done with the Israelites if he had caught them? If he had not been destroyed in the Red Sea? What, What would have transpired? And yet God had delivered them from his vengeful hand. They had also, by this point, received the miraculous provision of manna. And I would add to that, probably, no doubt, they had already received other types of provision and so forth, water and other things, by this point. They had forgotten all of it. All of it was forgotten. Their focus was singular and so small that they forgot about it. Do you realize when you and I complain, what we are forgetting is that God has already bestowed many blessings on us. To go back to the illustration, if you complained if you complained about what you had for lunch, at least you had a lunch, amen? And, and probably sometime within the last week, you probably got to choose what you got to eat. Now, I'll tell you, there are probably some people in the world that have never gotten to choose what they can eat. And yet, you and I have a hard time deciding which restaurant to go to sometimes. What to cook from the bountiful supplies in our cabinets and our refrigerator. Man, God has been good to us. But boy, when we complain, you know what we're forgetting? I mean, my God has bestowed blessings on me already. Boy, you know, teenager, if you are tempted to complain tomorrow morning when your mom wakes you up for the third time to get up, to come to church, to go to camp, listen to me. You ought to be thankful you get the opportunity to go to camp. You ought to be thankful you have parents that will sacrifice to send you to camp. You ought to be thankful you have a church that values camp. You ought to be thankful. Many blessings have been bestowed upon you. You know, secondly, what we forget, and I think this is so crucial. Secondly, we, uh, when I complain, I've forgotten the consistent character of my God. <laughs> we forget the consistent character of our God. Already, God has proven himself faithful to the Israelites. His watch care over them, his providing for them, meeting their needs, doing what is best for them. It, it, it's his very character and promises that he'll be faithful. He's going to look out for you. He's going to watch over you. Here is what God has promised. And for sake of time, you can turn to these passages, but I'm going to read them for you. The first one is Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Listen carefully what God says unto Israel. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will bring you into in unto the land concerning the which did I did swear to give it to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and I will give it to you for an inheritance I am the Lord and think about what the promises that flowed from that. Listen, I am faithful. I'm going to do this for you. I've done this for you. I'm going to, it just continues. Notice this passage the Same book, Exodus chapter 23, verse 20, and then 25 through 31. Verse 20 says this, Behold, God speaking to Israel, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Listen to me. I sure am thankful that God makes the same promise to you and I. As we trust him, you know what your God will do? He will keep you. 
And he will bring you to a place he has prepared for you. Listen, my friend, if you trusted in Jesus Christ, you're guaranteed of heaven. God's going to bring you there. And you guys can trust it. That's his consistent character. Why? Because all of his promises, the power of his promises, are found in his consistent character. See, here's what's neat, teenager. You go to camp and you make decisions and, and you make them in response to a preacher saying, thus saith the Lord. Here's what God's word says. And, and smiling, can I tell you, God has promised you, based upon his character, that he will bless you and help you and keep you in those decisions you make. As you follow him, as you look to him, as you lean on him for daily strength to do it. The passage goes on, it says this, And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall be nothing, cast there, nothing that cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. I will send my fear before thee which shall drive out and, uh, excuse me, back up, and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite and the Canaanite and the Hittite from before thee. Verse 29, I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. May I just stop a second? Hey, do you understand what God just said to Israel? I'm gonna provide all this. I'm gonna cast out all the nations ahead of you but I'm going to do it in a time that is perfect for you. You're not going to get to the land and find, oh my goodness, it's been empty for so long. The animals, the lions, the tigers have taken over. How in the world? No, no, no. God says, I'm going to drive them out slowly before you. As you possess the land, you'll take more of it. My goodness, our God is good. Our God is good in his timing and what he says they're doing. It's all based upon his consistent character. Now listen to me. The moment you and I complain that something isn't fair, that something isn't right, we are assaulting the very character of God. Because our God knows what's best for you. He knows what's best for me. He knows what is perfect. His timing is perfect. And boy, when you and I complain and we whine about something in our lives and at home and our church and, and the youth group and, and situations and things we face and we complain and we whine, you know what we're saying to God? Uh-oh, there's a chink in your armor. There's a problem in your character. And my friend, I'll tell you right now, there's nothing wrong with the character of God. He's faithful as he's always been. He's as holy as he's always been. He's as just as he's always been. He's as fair as he's always been. He is a good and gracious God. And what we just read about and quote, he is plenteous in mercy. His timing is perfect. He goes on and says this, By little and little I will drive them out from before thee, until thou be increased and inherit the land. I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea, even unto the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the hand, land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. What a promise. You see, my friend, when you and I complain about our circumstances, that something uh, is happening to me that I don't like, that's not right, that it's unfair, that it shouldn't be happening, that I want it a different way, we are salting the very character of God. Is he not sovereign, in control? Could he not change the circumstances if that is what is best? Yes! But our God knows what is best. We trust that it flows from his hand. Does he not have your best interest in mind? Does he not operate for your good and his own glory? Does he withhold good from them that walk uprightly? Does God make mistakes? Does God not know what is best for you? The moment you and I complain, we're saying that. We're assaulting the very character of God. Because my friend, his character is consistent. And every one of his promises rests upon that. And his character never fails. But the problem is, complaining forgets the correct answers to all those questions and many others. When we whine and complain, we're essentially saying, I know better than God. This should happen better than it is. Thirdly, you know what we also forget in complaining? In complaining, I, I have forgotten the continual command given by God. 
See, it's clear from the text in Numbers 11 that God doesn't like complaining. It displeases him so much so that he destroys some of them with fire, the discipline of God. No, don't miss this, okay? Hey, uh, mom and dad, you can answer. A teenager may be a little shy to do so, okay? When, when one of our children in a youth group or something, I've seen in a youth group so many times as a youth pastor, and uh, when somebody doesn't like something you're doing, when they're complaining and they're whining, they're part of the group, and you're like, okay, let's go over here. Let's do this, and let's go play this game like, i don't want to play that game that's a boring game last time i played it i lost and so i don't want to play it again let me ask you this where do you typically find the complainers in the group in the back can i tell you how many times a youth pastor be like hey 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 you come on hurry up we're starting get over here come on you got to get here and do they go faster when you do that no it seems like they go into a lower gear that you didn't know they had they even go slower I don't know how that's possible. They do. They go slower. Now listen, here's what's amazing to me. I, I read this and I chuckle because I'm like, oh, Moses experienced this. Who was consumed by fire? Verse 1, those in the uttermost parts of the camp. Now I just picture these are the complainers. <laughs> these are ones, I don't want to pick up our tent. Why do we have to go to a new place? Why do we have to do this? Why is it that all we have is manna? We haven't eaten meat since Egypt. That's the context of the passage here. They're whining, complaining. And God <laughs> hands out discipline. Now listen, it, it's something God takes serious. That's what this passage proves. But it's not just an Old Testament truth. It's a New Testament truth. God has commanded you and I not to whine and complain, not to murmur in life. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. Neither murmur ye complain, as some of them also murmured. And notice the story. As we're destroyed of the destroyer. He, he's referencing maybe this time, another time, that Israel, many of them complained, and God punished them. They murmured. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14 puts it pretty, plain, uh, pretty plainly. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Here's what I would also add to that, okay? And I think this is a, a fair addition or application to this verse. It says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. I would also say this, endure all things without murmurings and disputing. Endure all things. Go through it. <laughs> It's okay, you go through it, but don't complain and whine. Are there not things in life that you and I have to face that we necessarily don't like? That we don't want to do, that we don't want to take care of? Teenagers, there's going to be some time this week at camp that something is asked of you that you, des uh, you don't necessarily like, you don't enjoy. It's not your favorite thing to do. Well, let me tell you, the Bible says do all things, endure all things without complaining, without murmurings, without disputing. Young person at home this week, hey, mom and dad's going to ask you to do something that you probably don't like, don't want to do. Well, endure it. Do all things without murmurings and disputing. Those going to camp, look up this way. I've got a news flash for you, a very important announcement. Something on this camp trip is not going to go the way you want. I know that's hard to believe. The question is, how will you respond? Will you remember the command and say, okay, wait a minute, God has commanded me not to complain. So I'm not going to do it. I, I really don't like this. It's not my favorite thing. And, and uh, you arrive at the gas station, they're out of Dr. Pepper. Oh, yeah. Heartbreak. Okay? <laughs> what, what do you do? You complain, okay? They, they, they don't have your favorite fruit. I mean, we could go on. In fact, let me list. Here's some things that could happen because I, this is what I can guarantee, I guarantee you one thing's going to happen this week, young person. Something is going to go wrong. In many years of going to camp, there has not been one year that I've gone to camp that something hasn't gone wrong. And the way that I would like it, and the way that I wanted it to go, or the way it should go in some sense, something has gone wrong the way I expected. See, here's what it could be. You don't get the seat on the bus you want. Oh, Pastor Henry, you didn't go there. Yes, I did. Adults, if you've never seen it, it's one of the great delights of being a youth pastor. You throw open the doors on the bus, and it is like a mad scramble. It is like Black Friday to get the best seat. They're throwing things. They're launching themselves. They're throwing things over seats to get it there. It was there first. I claim it. They'll claim it six months out if they can. It's all about a seat. You know, my friend, can I tell you? You ain't probably not going to get the seat that you want. But it doesn't have to ruin your week at camp. 
You know what else could happen? You might not get the bunk that you want. <laughs> That's another fun thing, by the way. <laughs> if you've never been to camp and watched us throw open the doors and them fighting over bunks and trying to get one and jumping on them and so forth. You may not, they may not have your favorite food or they may not have any food you like. Your cabin might be too hot during the day and too cold at night. It's likely you'll probably lose something. You will not get the playing time in sports you want. You won't get to sit by who you want to at a service. It'll probably rain at all the wrong times. You won't get picked for something. You won't win in sports or a music contest that you want to win or you think you should. And the list goes on and on. Any one of them could be either an igniter for you to have forgetful complaining or it could be the start of mindful obedience to the command. I jokingly say, boy, every year I've had something wrong. Listen, there was a year that we traveled from Virginia to Tennessee and it was hot, middle of summer hot, and we didn't get down the road very far. We were in a bus that had no windows whatsoever and the heat went out, or the heat went out, yeah, I wish. The AC went out on it. And we had to travel in that. We put all the girls in one bus, all the boys in one bus, and all of us boys sweated together. It's like a sauna in there. That was not fun. There was another time that we had a bus breakdown not an hour and a half from camp on a Friday night coming home. Listen to me, that was Friday night. We did not get home to early Sunday morning. By the time we got a different bus and so forth and so on, we had another, in fact, it was the same trip. Um, we had waited Saturday. We got a new bus in the middle of the day Saturday. We're back on our way to home to Virginia. We get down the road a couple hours. Guess what? We blow a tire. At that moment, we were turning around asking each other, who's Jonah? Who is it? We're kicking him out. Literally, we didn't get home till Sunday morning early. I had to be back for Sunday school. It was a fun day, fun weekend. Okay, things are going to happen. Uh, there was another time, and man, don't do this. There's one time, teenager, don't do this. I had a teenager who threw up on the bus, didn't tell anybody, put it in a lunchbox. I know, I'm sorry if you have a weak stomach, but if I had to endure it, I'm sharing it. <laughs> didn't find out till we smelled it. I remember sitting up front saying, what is going on? <laughs> and turn around asking, and you ask it, and you can see by the facial reaction, oh yeah, I know who that was. We went on another trip, and this was kind of uh, innocuous, but we went on another trip. We walked into a Taco Bell. We were all starving hungry. We walked into a Taco Bell. They said, hey, welcome. By the way, we don't have any taco meat. Taco Bell didn't have any ground beef. What do you do when your Taco Bell doesn't have taco meat? Here's what you do. You order chicken. You order chicken. And that really is the principle, isn't it? What do you do when your Taco Bell doesn't have any taco meat? Well, I can't believe that this is Taco Bell. I'm going to call five different numbers until we get some taco meat and Taco Bell. I can't believe this is happening. Isn't this America? Hey, listen to me. Can I just tell you, what do you do when your Taco Bell has no taco meat? You order chicken. You know what that means? You be content with such things as you have. You be content. That's what the Bible verse says here. Notice it, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know what Paul did here? I love it. He says, listen, here's the principle. Hey, conversation be without covetousness. Don't, don't be envious. That's a good another truth for a trip to camp. Don't be envious of someone else. But also, don't complain. Be content with such things as you have. Notice what he does. He bases us on the very character of God. I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide. I'm going to meet your needs. You're not going to go with it. You're not going to die. You're not, I'm going to take care of you. Be content with such things as ye have. Paul would add in, ten, in his challenge to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8, in having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Paul made the point just a couple of verses before how beneficial obeying this command would be for all of us. Notice what he says. He says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Man, I love this verse, and I think it's so appropriate. You want to have a good time at camp this week? Pursue godliness. Be content in every situation and circumstance that you find yourself in. Now listen to me. Don't miss this truth. I don't believe that if we go down the road, as I'm driving, as I get the privilege of doing so uh, this year, okay, as I'm driving, I hear in the back a teenager say, oh, it's too hot. I don't think that Jesus Christ, that God in heaven is going to drop fire and consume them. I hope not, new bus and everything. But anyway, 
Okay. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it's going to be the same discipline. But listen to me. Don't miss it. Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, Paul in Corinthians, here's the point. It may not be the same discipline, but I can assure you in heaven there's the same displeasure over your complaining. See, Numbers 11, Ron said he was displeased. Can I tell you, when you and I whine and complain, as we forget those things, God is displeased. And if you and I truly love God, that ought to break our heart. That the displeasure is still the same. As we head off tomorrow morning early, make sure your spirit is free of complaining and that it's full of contentment. That contentment being produced by remembering your blessings, by remembering the very character of God, remembering the command of God. So number one, let's make sure that we're packing something tomorrow as we go, as we come into church, as we uh, interact at our home. Let's make sure we have a spirit free of complaining and full of contentment. Number two, quickly, let's make sure that we have a heart free of rebellion and full of submission to and respect for those in charge. Boy, this is so crucial in any setting in the Christian life. It's that we have a heart free of rebellion and yet full of submission to and respect for those in charge. If you have a heart attitude that says no one is going to tell me what to do, no one is going to convince me there are wrong things in my life, I don't care what God's word says, I don't care what the preacher says, I don't care what mom says, I don't care what dad says, I'll warn you tonight, you are on dangerous ground. Dangerous ground. God doesn't mince words about a rebellious heart that refuses to submit, surrender, and show due respect to those in authority in any area of life. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, we probably know the verse very well. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. We think of those as being great, heinous sins, and certainly they are. But so, as much as rebellion and stubbornness. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 11 says, An evil man seeketh only rebellion. We're not mincing words. I'm just cutting to the thick of the matter tonight. I fear that there are some that get very little out of church. Some that get very little out of youth group. Some who learn little at home. Some who get very little out of camp because their attitude is one of rebellion to authority in their heart. We know all around us that the reality is simple, that our culture is suspicious of authority, and it often breeds disrespect for authority. And may I just be honest tonight, teenager, well, as you look up this way, I fear some of that worldly culture has crept into our homes and our youth group. Where not only do we have a lack of obedience, but we also have a lack of respect for authority that goes with it. God takes it very serious if you and I harbor a heart of rebellion and lack of submission as one of his children. An attitude that refuses to submit and uh, yield. You see, I fear that camp will not be great this year in someone's life because they are unwilling to confess a heart of rebellion and choose rather to submit and respect to those in charge, not only there at camp, but at home and in church. You see, home and church will not be as great and will not be great until a heart of rebellion is confessed and an attitude of submission and respect is put in its place. See, our God gave us the correct way to respond to authority in our lives, including our youth pastor and sponsors at camp, our youth group, uh, parents at home, whatever the case may be. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, Christ, God puts it clearly, obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. You can't, you can't you obey, submit, have an attitude of respect and honor to those in authority. Whether it's your youth pastor or your mom and dad at home, my friend, you want to make home great. You want to make camp great. Obey and submit. Make sure in your heart you're not harboring a heart full of rebellion, but one of surrender and submission. I love it because why? Boy, provide a means for them to have joy, not grief, because that's unprofitable for you. I want to jokingly say, you don't want to see an angry Pastor Tony. That's kind of what the verse alludes to, man. Don't make, hey, why? Why upset them? Why disobey and cause them grief and heartache and hurt? 
Why do that to mom and dad? Why do that to your youth pastor? Rather obey and be respectful. That's God's cry to us. That we'd have a heart free of rebellion. Not, uh, and full of submission to respect for those in charge. You see, camp will go great when your heart's attitude is that of submission and obedience and respect for your youth leaders. Let me see, can I just put it bluntly? Okay? I, I, it worries me when I hear stories. Young people. It worries me when I hear stories or comments from parents who, who make a comment, well, I just can't get so-and-so to do anything at home. They just don't obey. They just won't listen. They won't do what I ask of them. My friend, listen to me. You are on very dangerous ground. A rebellious heart is nothing to play around with. It's nothing to play around with. Get it right. Confess it. And learn that, boy, it brings great joy to all involved if you have an attitude of surrender, submission, and obedience and respect. I love that the scriptures call you children to not only obey your parents, but to honor them, to respect them. And we could say for many of these passages, the same goes through any authority in your life. How do you do that? Well, start with that obedience. I love what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man uh, for the Lord's sake. Just obey it. It pleases God. How do you do that? Listen, okay, let me just give you a simple illustration. Teenagers, okay, look up this way, okay? Give you a simple illustration, okay? Let's say that we stop somewhere on the way down there and uh, ah, use the restroom, get gas, whatever, and Pastor Randy goes, all right, time to load up. What's going to be your response? Oh, I have to get back on the bus. And, and boy, you, you, know, you keep doing what you want to do. Why don't you instead say, okay, yeah, yes, sir. And you obey Pastor Tony. You obey right away. You, be, you respond immediately. You see, for some reason, we get this idea, well, that's not cool. That's not a thing. And we look for everybody else to do it. Let me ask you, teenager, who's going to be the leader in the youth group to do what's right? To respond with obedience and respond with respect. Pastor Tony's talking. Hey, guys, let's be quiet. Let's listen. Because that's respect. That's honor. At home, which sibling is going to be the one? Hey, guys, mom and dad's talking. Let's be quiet. Let's listen. Mom and dad are talking. Hey, we need to listen. Mom and dad, this is honoring them. This is obedient to them. Young person, can I encourage you? God wants the best for you, and the best is being obedient to his commands. In this area of obeying those that have the authority over you. I just put it this way. Hard attitudes always show up, both good and bad. What hard attitude is showing up for you? What's going to show up at camp for you? What heart attitude do you have? Number three, quickly, and may I add this one, a heart free of rebellion, full of submission to and respect for those in charge, and last but not least, a mind and soul free of spiritual indifference, full of excitement for meeting with God. There is truth to the reality that the church and the home are supposed to be youth group, are supposed to be places that we want to meet God. The home ought to be a respite from the world in which we know God is the center and we can commune and fellowship with God in the home as a family. The church is the same place, a respite, a time away, and a time of meeting with God. Camp is supposed to be a great time of meeting with God, and yet there has to be a desire, a yearning for it. The psalmist said it well in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? What do you anticipate about camp? Oh, man, there's a whole lot of fun stuff to anticipate about camp. Cowboy town, everything, uh, meeting uh, other teenagers from other youth groups, playing sports, uh, music. Uh, there's just a whole bunch. I hope you're looking forward to uh, spending time with God. We all have our traditions. There's some who I know are looking forward to the ice cream and ice cream floats and things like that and, and, and so forth. Some who are looking forward to the ices that they have in the, uh, the store there and so forth. Just many things we can look forward to. We all have things we look forward to about camp. One of my traditions down through the ages and through the years is every year that I go to camp, somewhere along the way, I get peppered, kippered beef jerky. Jack Link's, by the way, that's the brand. It's just a weird tradition. Every time I drive somewhere, I, I, gas station, I'll pick up one because that, that's the only time around the year I have it. I enjoy it. I look forward to it. I crave it. Right now, I can almost taste it. 
It's that good. That's just part. That's camp for me. It's funny. It started one time back in Virginia. I got it at camp, and I was driving at that time, and I remember I had some left, and I stuck it in a pocket there. Come October, November that year, I was driving the same bus. I reaching down. Oh, I found my leftover beach jerky. It was green, all different colors, but anyway, I didn't eat it. So this has been a tradition that I've done for many years, okay? And I look, I'm already looking forward to being blast. Those are things like that about camp. There's other things I'm looking forward to about camp. That's great, teenager. I'm glad you're looking forward to different things. But let me ask you this, okay? What are you thinking about spiritually about camp this year? For your soul and your spirit, could you take it? Could you leave it? Is it just about those things that don't really matter, they don't last for eternity? Is it just about the physical things? Or is there something about this? Wait a minute. This is a focused time that I get with God and his word. It's not just a retreat with my friends. It's a retreat with my best friend, the savior of my soul, the God who gave me heaven for eternity. You see, oh, God isn't only at camp. At camp. But it's worth anticipating and getting excited about meeting God. Hearing several messages, devotions, and uh, morning and evening, many times that we get to focus on God in my own life compared to the Word of God. You see, camp is a time where I get away in a different place, where the focus is on me and you drawing closer to God without distractions that are here at home, yeah, without the normal routines of life. It's a coming away. I like that. I get to come away with God in a sense. That is what camp is about. And if you're not anticipating, in it, friend, it will not be a great week of camp. If you're not looking forward to it, say, man, yeah, I'm looking forward to the slushies, I'm looking forward to Cowboy Town, I'm looking forward to sports, that's all great, but man, I am really looking forward to God speaking to me. I am anticipating, excited about what God is going to do in my heart, in my life. Are you looking forward to that? Are you yearning to see and hear from God this week? Are you excited about looking to God to learn from Him, to grow closer to Him? It is an atmosphere that focuses on is conducive for meeting with God, just like church, just like what we want the home to be, just like what the youth group should be. But if your soul and mind are not fixed upon that, if they really have no desire for that, if, friend, tonight, truth be told, teenager, you're indifferent spiritually, and you really have no yearning. Now listen to me. You're more interested in meeting another person from another church than you are meeting with God. It will not be a great camp week. If you are more interested in just going and getting away from home and, and getting a break from what your other summer, summer normal routines and you have no inclination, no desire to say, wait a second, this is about meeting with God, coming away with Him. If you have no desire along those parts, it will not be a great week of camp. The desire and the, the heart is not there. You know, I'm sure that somewhere along the way... <laughs> One of us sponsors will hear a teenager say something like this. Well, this year at camp just wasn't as good as last year. When I hear that, I, I want to ask something like this. Oh, my bad. Did God not show up this year? Because camp being great is not dependent upon how good the weather is. Camp being great is not dependent on what kind of what food they have, who I get to meet, what, how we do in sports. No, those things are unimportant in the grand scheme of things. What's important is this. God's showing up. Will you? Will you? God wants to do something great. See, I know the answer to that question long before I were to ask it to one of the teenagers. It isn't that God didn't show up. It's that the teenager didn't show up with the right things. They weren't prepared and ready for a great week of camp. I want to ask you, and we're done here. Teenager, would you listen up? If you're going to camp especially, but each and every one of us, as we think in our home, in our church, as we could apply it, let me ask you three questions. Three questions to make camp great. I could ask the same thing about you, your church, your home, and teenager, if you're not going to camp about the youth group. Number one is this. You want to make camp great? Let me ask you this. Who will look to the Lord this week? See, when I go to camp, and when you go to camp, it is about a time of looking to God. 
When we gather around in the auditorium there and the preaching starts, when we gather for devotions in the cabins each night, when you have devotions in the morning and you're studying God's Word, it's about looking to God. So my question is this, teenager that's going to camp, who is it in our youth group is going to be looking to God? And who is it that's going to be looking more to friends and looking within and, and trying to find, make camp great by something you want? Who's going to look to God? Number two, let me ask you this. Who will live for the Lord this week? It's not just about seeking God and, and the teaching and the preaching and the devotions. It's also about, hey, I, I want to pursue living for God. I want to do right. I don't want to complain. I, I don't want to be that person. I want to help someone else. I don't want to be kind in my words and my actions to other people in our youth group and at camp. Who's going to live for the Lord? And I think this applies to the youth group as a whole teenager. Who in our youth group is going to live for the Lord? Who's going to put his word first and obedience to it? Then last but not least, who's going to lead for the Lord? Who's going to be a vocal, authentic, godly leader in our youth group this week? I don't care who leads in sports. I don't care who leads in the fun. I don't care who, who makes the most jokes. I don't care who, who, who people want to hang out with. That, that really doesn't mean anything to me. My question is this. Who is going to lead spiritually in our youth group? Because we need vocal, authentic, godly teenagers that want to follow God, and that bring others along. And can I tell you, a great place to do that at is camp? To get the ball rolling for our youth group? Because I'll tell you right now, and Pastor Tony, you can ask him after the service. Feel free to. I feel like there is a hole. There's an empty spot when it comes to godly leaders in our youth group. And I don't mean that unkindly. I just mean that the vacancy is there for somebody to step up. It doesn't mean we don't have godly teenagers. Certainly there are. But we need somebody who's going to step up and lead vocally, authentically, and bring others with them. We need leaders. Who's going to lead? You say, Pastor Henry, I want to. That's me. At camp, you're going to respond to messages like this. You say, yeah, that, I want that to be me. Well, if you answer me to those questions, you know where it starts? It starts with confessing a spirit of complaining. Because listen, you will never be in the, a leader in the youth group if you are a complainer in the youth group. You will never be a leader at home, a leader in the youth group, if you are a complainer at home. It starts with confessing, a spirit of complaining. And you say, you know what? In whatever state I find myself, I'm going to be content. Having food and raiment, I'm going to be content. I'm going to have an attitude and a spirit of contentment. Number two, it starts with confessing a heart attitude of rebellion. You may not be a vocal rebellious, rebellious young person, but you may be a passive, quiet, rebellious person. You need to confess it either way. Because you'll never be a leader. You'll never live for God. You'll never look to the Lord until you confess a rebellious heart and you strive to submit in obedience and to respect authority in your life. And number three, it starts with confessing spiritual indifference. Lord, I'm cold spiritually. Lord, your word doesn't move me like it once did. I, I just, I'm not anticipating camp for you to meet with me and speak to me and grow me and mold me and make me into what you want. Teenager, can I tell you, if you're indifferent right now tonight, you ought to find yourself at this altar tonight and say, God, as I go to camp tomorrow, I want you to do a work. I want to meet with you. I want to come away with you. My heart's not ready for that. Will you move in my heart? Will you prepare me? Will you do great things and meet with me this week so I will be different? Can I tell you right now, my prayer is for every teenager to come back off of that bus different than how they got on it spiritually god will do a work that he'll ignite something he'll revive something i appreciate so much brother flanders last week saying listen uh, revival is not a one and done thing it comes periodically it's something we need routinely to come my friends our youth our teens need revival you and i need revival teenager you need revival and what a great opportunity at camp to get revival but will you anticipate that or is your spirit indifferent to spiritual things? Why don't you tonight ask the Holy Spirit to build excitement in your soul for being with your God? As we close tonight, as we head into the invitation, could I just ask you, do you have these three things? Teenager for camp. Uh, 
I said it before already from this pulpit the last couple weeks. Preparation camp does not start when we get down there. It's already started. God's knocking on your door tonight about one of these areas, about one of these things, saying, you need to get this right before you go to camp. Boy, you're a complainer. Boy, your heart is rebellious in this area. You may be good in all this, but at home you're, you're rebellious here. and you're not, Or maybe it's you're just spiritually indifferent. The messages that Pastor Tony has preached the last couple Wednesdays should have moved your heart. They should have moved the needle spiritually, but it didn't. You didn't. You weren't moved. God's word didn't touch you, and you're spiritually indifferent. You don't anticipate meeting with God. Would you confess it? Would you get it right before you get down to camp? My friend, how is it for you and I, in our homes and in our church and our youth group? Boy, God wants to do a great work, but you and I have to bring something in our luggage these things.